for joining the latest in a series of webinars by the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. The Business Council's in Washington, D.C. and was started 25 years ago. Uh, today, we're talking about, uh, in celebration of Ukraine's independence, 1991 to 2020, 29 years of independence, moving Ukraine forward, a very exciting journey, a very amazing 29 years. We have a panel of people who have been involved uh, almost all that time, and some of them longer, uh, to talk about their reflections, their experiences, their insights, and accomplishments uh, of Ukraine being an independent country and moving forward. For just a moment, I'd like to, to take a second to say that we want to, uh, this morning, remember Marta Kolomayets. She is from Chicago. She was a Ukrainian-American. She went to Ukraine almost 30 years ago, was a leader in the expat community, introduced the Ukrainian Weekly to Ukraine, and for seven years has headed up the Fulbright program there. <clears throat> Marta died earlier this week at age 61. She was an amazing patriot, amazing friend of Ukraine, and we want to take a moment to, uh, to remember her and her outstanding work. Today we have uh, Michael Blazer with us, the co-founder and president and CEO of Sigma Blazer, private investment firm from Houston, Texas. We have John Taft, the former ambassador uh, to Lithuania, Georgia, Ukraine, and Russia. He said he wanted to be a fifth ambassador, but we told him four was probably enough. Uh, Bill Taylor, uh, who's uh, vice president for strategic strategy and security at the U.S. Institute of Peace. He was in charge of the embassy in Ukraine twice and uh, been involved for years and years and years. And in Arena, Polly Eslavili, Arena was born in the country of Georgia. She went to Kiev to go to law school. She fell in love with the Ukraine and uh, she started her own law firm and she's watched everything happen that we're going to talk about today for 30, 35 years or more. We expect that Kurt Volker uh, will be joining us uh, shortly, uh, uh, former ambassador to NATO and uh, was a U.S. representative for Ukraine uh, uh, for several years. So let's move ahead and talk about uh, this amazing event uh, in the history of Ukraine and many ways the history of the world as Ukraine became independent. Uh, so let's start with uh, Bill Taylor. Bill, you've, uh, I first met you when you were the uh, assistance coordinator at the State Department for the new independent states in the early 1990s. You uh, also fell in love with Ukraine. You found a way to stay involved in a variety of capacities including being the ambassador. So let's start out. Bill, your comments, your reflections, your experiences. Morgan, thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be invited. Uh, it's an honor to appear with, uh, with this panel that you have assembled here. This is, uh, uh, this is a great, I'm looking forward to all of, all of these conversations, all of these comments and conversations. Morgan, uh, as you say, Independence Day, um, uh, is an opportunity to look back. Um, uh, I'm not going to look back all the way until 1991, uh, but uh, others will. Uh, I'm just going to look back over the last year and then also try to look forward because um, there are exciting things um, that we could support um, that Ukrainians are doing um, so that they will continue Independence Day celebrations uh, for, forever into the future. So, so Last year, just remember, we'll all remember, a year ago, um, uh, August 24th last year, um, the new administration, the Zelensky administration, um, the president was in office, the parliament hadn't yet been seated, the new government was not yet in place, um, and there was, there was great excitement, great anticipation um, across the country. Um, you know, not everyone voted for... Uh, for uh, Mr. Zelensky, but a lot did. A lot of Ukrainians did, and the international community was excited. And uh, you know, the attendance there at the celebration on the Maidan was was uh, was representative across the world, and uh, and there was a, a feeling of excitement. Um, uh, and to be fair, 
um, there were good things happened over this past year um, in Ukraine. There was a lot of progress made. Um, again, let's, let's recognize kind of where we were a year ago and where we are today. Uh, just in that period of time, there's been some great progress. And they had some great folks. They had some great Ukrainian patriots, um, scholars, politicians, um, lawyers, um, people who were ready to work um, and ready to focus on, on Ukraine's future. Um, and they, they did some good work. Um, uh, the big challenges, of course, um, uh, the Russians in the East, um, the, the uh, war that Russia is fighting against Ukraine in the first instance, uh, but Europe in the second instance, and the United States in the third instance, and the world more generally, um, is a, was and is um, a big concern um, for the president at that time and he, as he was putting together his, uh, uh, his team. Um, and that continues today, obviously, and we'll talk about that, I'm, I am sure. But there were some very good people that, the, that President Zelensky pulled into his team. Um, I'm thinking of the Minister of Defense. Um, uh, that, that, uh, I'm thinking, frankly, of the National Security Defense Council. Um, there were some people there who were dedicated, focused, and recognized, um, and became further recognized, more widely recognized, for doing some good things. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. The other thing, of course, was on the rule of law. Um, um, and here again, as everybody on this panel knows, and as everybody kind of tuning in to Ukraine independence, rule of law is a big challenge for Ukraine. They have to succeed. And, and Ukrainians know this. And I'm sure Rina is gonna, going to talk about this. And I'm sure Michael is going to make the point about how uh, investors um, need the rule of law. And there, were, there, were, there was progress. And there were people in the administration, the Ukrainian administration, um, again, a year ago, we're not in office, but, but by the end of August of last year, there was a, there was a cabinet in place, um, a new prosecutor general, as, uh, as, as we know, who did some very good things throughout the time that, that he was um, in office. So, so that was important. The last thing um, uh, that the last area uh, is, and Morgan, you've already referred to, is leadership. Um, and there are as we know, there are great Ukrainian leaders um, who have stepped up in the past, and we'll probably talk about some of those over the, uh, over the time of an independent Ukraine's history, um, looking back on Independence Day, but there are some current leaders, and there are some leaders who were in the government uh, and made contributions over this past year um, who are now still thinking about how they can contribute. Um, and and I, I mentioned that we ought to look for ways to support those Ukrainians as they want to make their country strong. Um, and let me just say, I, I won't, ah, here's Kurt. Kurt Volker tunes in, in. With a tie on, I will note. Yes, <laughs> all right. you know, in all due respect for Ukraine and Ukraine's National Day, I wanted to uh, put on a tie and look appropriate. You do look appropriate, Kurt. And the only thing more would have been a Vishivanka, but uh, that, that was <laughs> That's the right true. So, and may I also say I apologize for being late. I had the time wrong on my calendar, but I was doing good work because I'm participating in organizing a human chain in Washington from the Lithuanian to the Belarusian embassies on Sunday in solidarity with the real one going on from Vilnius to Minsk. So, Kurt, that is good work. That is good work. We want and, uh, everyone to show up and take part. <laughs> and Kurt, I was just remembering... Um, uh, last year's Independence Day celebration that you and I were together on the Maidan yes. and had, had good good conversations. But I was also just I'm, Morgan. I'm not going to go wrong here, so I just want to uh, I want to highlight some work that is now getting started by Ukrainians in these three areas that I mentioned. Um, uh, and and these are people who were in the government who are no longer in the government but are committed and are dedicated or are experienced and have ideas that, that uh, will make Ukraine stronger um, and will make uh, Ukraine a better place, better for investors, better for Ukrainian citizens. Um, and the first one I will mention is on what I just said on leadership. Um, there is a Center for Human Capital um, and it is focused on, it is, it is organ all three of these organizations are brand new um, and they're, or, they're just organizing and they're putting together uh, their own ideas about how to contribute. Uh, but this first one is focused on, uh, on human capital, on people, on leadership, 
um, they're, they're taking a look at the important issues and they've got ideas about a national conversation, a national dialogue, a discussion um, on Donbass, um, on the conflict in Do on IDPs um, uh, from, from Donbass. Um, they want to make this non-political. Uh, they want to make this non-partisan. They want to make this uh, uh, a, a nationwide conversation um, about how to um, how to organize uh, uh, for for this issue and how to bring new young leaders, well trained and well motivated, into the into the dialogue so that they can emerge into uh, into leading Ukraine forward. The second one um, is a call is called the Center for Defense Strategies, and this of course focuses on threats to Ukrainian security, in particular from the West, in particular from Mr. Putin. Um, um, they are looking at, um, at policies. Um, they're also looking at, at uh, procurement reform, um, defense industry reform. And again, the, you know, there's some people uh, who are very experienced in this, who had roles in the previous government, who are putting this together um, as well. And then finally, a, a third organization that merits our support um, is called the Institute for Democracy and the Rule of Law. Um, and here we have work that they're putting together, these are Ukrainians putting this together on anti-corruption, um, near and dear to Kurt's heart. heart. Um, this, this is anti-corruption um, um, defined broadly um, and judicial reform. Um, these are uh, among others. I mean, this is a, this is a team. This is a group headed up by uh, a committed uh, reformer who has done some great work and wants to do more. And again, from these, all three of these are from outside the government. I am very glad to provide more information, Morgan, to you and your your members. But I think all of us, Ukrainians, Americans, Europeans, we ought to be interested in the success of the Center for Human Capital and the success of the Center for Defense Strategies and the Institute for Democracy and the Rule of Law. This, this is gonna be the future. This is gonna be the future of Ukraine. And again, going into Independence Day is uh, looking forward. So Morgan, back over to you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, we probably had 20 personal meetings with you or 25 in all the years with the members of the Business Council in Kiev and Warsaw. We look forward to when we get together in Warsaw and have another one of those personal face-to-face -face meetings. Thank you very much. Michael Blazier, you were raised in Kharkiv, Ukraine. You came to the United States in 1978. You established a very business successful career with Exxon. With your brother Lev in the early 1990s, you came back to the homeland, started Sigma Blazier Private in Equity Investment Fund. You raised 100 million in 94, 95 to support business and economic development in Ukraine. Through the years, you've managed over $1 billion in assets. Now, 26 years later, your observations, please, as one of the major American Ukrainian uh, um, uh, leaders in, uh, in business. Thank you, Morgan. Um, happy to be here. Um, I'm honored to be on this panel of, uh, as Irina put it, all-star panel. Um, amazing, very distinguished uh, uh, people that are uh, on this panel. So I'm uh, indeed honored to be a part of this panel. So thank you for inviting me. Welcome to my office. As uh, you can see, I mean, it's market hours. The market just opened. So I have to kind of keep an eye on what's going on there. We're trading. Um, but... Um, I feel that uh, I'm a part of this wonderful team of friends. I've been friends with uh, everybody on this panel. I mean, Ambassador Teft, of course, Bill Taylor, Ambassador Taylor. I mean, a great friend of mine for many, many years. Irina Baliashvili, Ambassador Volker, Morgan, of course, you. So everybody, I'm looking at my screen here and I'm seeing all these faces and I feel that we are together in this virtual space. Um, so... Uh, let me talk about uh, a little bit about the world first before I get down to Ukraine. Um, as I sit here in Houston, I'm in Houston, Texas right now. Things are not looking particularly good here in Houston, in Texas. Uh, we live in Harris County, which unfortunately leads the state of Texas in terms of uh, uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19, uh, in terms of death. So we, we're in pretty bad shape. I'm sure that um, most of the participants uh, know 
but the numbers are uh, really staggering. Texas, just Texas, the state of Texas has now over 550,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19. And we have over 10,000 fatalities here in Texas. United States overall, uh, five and a half million cases and over 175,000 deaths. It's unimaginable. Unfortunately, with this uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, the economic impact comes along with that. So in the United States, uh, we have now at over 10% unemployment rate, but it's still somewhere 25 to 30 million unemployed. The numbers vary depending who estimates them, but, but it is an unbelievable number. Again, I, I, I never could imagine that will be there. US GDP had the largest drop in the second quarter of this year in the history of our country, nine and a half percent drop in GDP, which translates in 32.9% annualized uh, negative GDP, which is again, mind boggling. The world overall has 22 million cases and uh, close to 800,000 deaths. Ukraine is somewhere in the middle of the pack, 94,000 cases roughly and over 2000 deaths. On the per capita basis, Ukraine actually is much better place than the United States right now. So I, I wish I was actually in Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's safer and, 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 and it seems to be in a much better shape. Um, now, having said that, we, we, are, we are here because we're celebrating an event, 29 years of Ukrainian independence. So let me go back to that. But I think it's important to keep in mind that we live in a different world today than even six months ago, and certainly a year ago. So if we go back to Ukraine, what I want to share with you, uh, as, as Morgan said, they, I've been in Ukraine probably too long. I've been invested in Ukraine from uh, almost the first day. And, and uh, let me share with you some of my experiences and my views and my observations on what happened in the country. And I want to talk about kind of three things, uh, the past, the future, and the present of Ukraine. The past, as Irina and, and uh, almost everybody else here can attest to, um, it's a mixed history of some successes and some major disappointments. Uh, we've had, as a company, as a business, we had a very rough ride. We uh, had very exciting interest in things that, that happened to us, a lot of surprises, a lot of disappointments, a lot of accomplishments. As Morgan mentioned, we have invested over a billion dollars in Ukraine. And uh, overall, we have been successful, but it has been done uh, with so many obstacles that did not have to be there. I, I, I'm trying to go back over this almost 30 years of my life and trying to analyze why did we have so many obstacles? Why did we have to go through all of this when all that we were doing was bringing new fresh capital and the know-how from the West to Ukraine to help create wealth, create prosperity, to help Ukraine develop? Why did we have to face all of that? And honestly, the only answer that I've come up with is vested interest. Somehow over this period of initial five, 10 years of Ukrainian independence, vested interest have become so strong that it has become an obstacle. Ukraine managed over the last uh, 29, next year we'll celebrate 30 years, Ukraine has managed to build some uh, very good democratic institutions. And, and there are some traditions now that are established in Ukraine that clearly support the view that Ukraine is a truly democratic, independent country. Yes, it has problems. Yes, it has things that I wish it did not have. But unlike its neighbors, particularly the big neighbor to the east, it is a democratic country with a freedom of press, and then and, and, and people can actually be in that society with enough transparency and enough um, incentives to go forward and develop that. So overall, the past has been a mixed story, as I said. And the main reason for that is that in 1991, when Ukraine became independent, most people, including myself, felt very strongly that it was the country with the greatest potential 
from all of the former Soviet Union and probably all of the Eastern Europe. It had the greatest potential because of the size. It wasn't too big. It wasn't too small. It was just right because of the mineral resources, because of uh, the, the level of education of people, because of the geographic location, logistics. So a variety of things that made this country to be the country with the greatest potential. Unfortunately, over the last 30 years, almost 30 years, that has become an unfulfilled potential. A lot of missed opportunities. And, and, and that's, that's something that I hope can change uh, in the future. So let me talk about the future. Um, I, I think the future is still exciting. Uh, I have to say that a lot of people are telling me that I tend to be overly optimistic when it comes to Ukraine. Maybe I am, but I just, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me when a country that great with people so good, with talents and potential that is all there, cannot just break out of this history of it. And, and, and I think it's possible and I think it will happen. Why, why am I still optimistic? Number one is new generation of people. When I travel around Ukraine, when I meet young people, when I meet this new generation of people that gives me new hope, they are different people. This vested interest, this whole concept, all of that is old and then actually unfamiliar to them. They want to live normal lives like they see on TV. And then and they are capable of doing that. They're smart, they're well-educated, they want to move forward. So that's number one. Number two, new technologies. We live in the world which has some amazing technologies which were unimaginable five, 10 years ago. And with those technologies available to this new generation of people, I think Ukraine can, in fact, have this breakthrough that I've been hoping for for the last almost 30 years. So the potential in my mind is still there. In addition to that, and then Bill was talking about it, I'm sure uh, other panel members will also address that. We have this new, younger, more enlightened political forces that, that uh, have actually less experience, sometimes no experience, which in a way can be good. They are now in the center stage and I'm, I'm still hopeful that, that Zelensky and, and, and his government and this new young political force can unleash the true force of Ukrainian people and Ukrainian potential. And that brings me to the last point that I want to make, and that is the present. And I did it on purpose. I talked about the past and the future, and now I really want to talk about the present. The present is very challenging globally, not just in Ukraine. So again, if you go back to, to what I said a few minutes ago, pandemic, economic crisis, financial crisis. And in addition to that, the world is divided as we've never seen it. The United States of America, my country, where I live for the last over 40 years, is divided as never before. I've never seen this country. I, I came to the United States in 1978. I've never seen that level of division. I'm having problems in my family trying to decide who is for whom. It's, it's unbelievable. It is painful. The level of tensions is unprecedented. Something is wrong. We need to get out of that. So that's, that's why this present is so challenging and difficult for all of us. Unfortunately, Ukraine can suffer even more than others because of all of these problems. And the reason for that is that Ukraine has been somewhat weak going into that and now can be affected even more. On the other hand, and, and that is the main point that I'd like to leave with all of you, this crisis can in fact present a unique opportunity for Ukraine. This pandemic can be actually a catalyst for the breakthrough, for the new development this can be a new beginning for Ukraine. I've been searching for it all these 30 years because I, I was trying to analyze why Ukraine did not make the breakthrough like Poland and Hungary and Czech Republic and others did. Now there is a chance to do this again. Why? With this horrible pandemic, economic collapse and the situation that we have in the world, the more radical steps can be more easily accepted. And now is the time to do it. 
Now is the time to unleash the true forces of Ukrainian society and allow this country to move forward. I hope we, the friends of Ukraine, Ukrainian people and Ukrainian government will not waste this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you for your many years of strong support for the US-Ukraine Business Council when we put everything back together in 2005. Uh, your strong support for all those years helped us get where we are today. Um, now let's go to, to Ambassador John Taft. Four ambassadorships, been involved in this part of this world for 30, 35 years. John, uh, your observations. Well, thanks very much, Morgan. I'm really glad to join my friends here and uh, on this uh, day to commemorate Ukraine's independence. Uh, you know, every U Independence Day for Ukraine uh, always takes me back to the days of 1991-92 when uh, the world as we knew it really changed in a matter of months. Uh, so, Bill, I will take us back to 91 because I think it helps put in perspective not only what's happened positively in Ukraine, but it also puts into uh, context the larger uh, issues of the things that Ukraine still has to do to become the modern nation that all of us support. Uh, in 1991 and two, I was the deputy director of the Soviet desk, uh, which became the Office of Independent States and Commonwealth Affairs after the end of the Soviet Union. And I think for me and for most of the foreign service officers working on Ukraine then, both in Washington and then John Gunderson and his team out in, uh, in Kyiv, uh, those days it really brought home almost on a daily basis uh, the importance of uh, the concepts of independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity. Uh, for us then, these were not just diplomatic code words. They were real concepts. They were meaningful as we watched Ukraine struggle to become an independent uh, nation. Um, I think we all remember uh, those days in August 29 years ago. Uh, Gorbachev, we'll remember, survived a coup attempt. The power shifted to Yeltsin. The process was launched, which would lead within months to the end of the USSR and the creation of the new independent states. August 24th, the Ukrainian Rada voted overwhelmingly to declare independence. And that declaration was later approved on December 1st in a national re referendum. The vote totals then were very significant. 92% uh, of all Ukrainians who voted, voted to approve the declaration. In Crimea, the vote was 54% in favor. And in the Donbass, 80% in favor. The total turnout was 84% of the Ukrainian population. We'll all remember that events moved quickly. Afterwards, December 5th, Ukrainians voted to secede from the Soviet Union, and Leonid Kravchuk was elected Ukraine's president. December the 8th, Yeltsin Kravchuk and Belarusian leader Shushkevich signed documents at a state dacha at Belovezhskaya Pusha in Belarus, declaring that the Soviet Union had see, effectively ceased to exist. December 25th, that Christmas day that I'll never certainly forget, the Soviet Union came to an end. The communist flag came down over the Kremlin and the new Russian flag was raised. In Kyiv, Ukraine became an independent state and the United States recognized it as an independent country. Our formal diplomatic relations started on January the 23rd. For the first six months of 92, uh, Ukraine worked really hard to strengthen its formal sovereignty and its independence from Russia. It implemented a policy which declared that Ukraine would maintain its own army, its own national bank, its own independent currency. During that period, our bilateral relations were being established and US-Ukrainian leaders exchanged visits back and forth leading up to the May 1992 visit to Washington of President Kravchuk, which was really a seminal event in the whole history of our relations. I have some very personal memories of that visit, and I'll share with you one story, which I think dramatizes the uh, importance of uh, two Ukrainians of their newfound independence. Uh, some of you will remember that Ukraine insisted that all treaties and bilateral agreements which the United States had with the Soviet Union be translated into Ukrainian and re-signed during that summit at the presidential and at lower levels as separate bilateral documents. And the reason I remember this so well is that I was put in charge of the document preparation process. 
these new documents really weren't necessary. Under international law, all the agreements automatically continued or transferred to successor states. But this was not stopping our Ukrainian friends. Somewhere they, can, they insisted that we get all of these done. And we had this long session where the interpreters, the translators, translated each of the documents. And somewhere I would remember something like 30 different documents had to be translated. Well, since I was in charge, they told me I had to initial each page of the translation at the bottom. Uh, and somewhere about two o'clock in the morning of the very day that the meetings and the first documents were due to be signed at the White House, the US and Ukrainian translators finally stopped arguing about the appropriate words in the many documents. And then I ended up initialing all the pages for the American so society as correct and binding. And I remember telling the translators that I really shouldn't be doing this because I didn't know Ukrainian at all. Uh, but they insisted and they just looked at me and said at about two o'clock in the morning, exhausted, bleary eyed, and they just said, sign the damn document so we could all go home. Uh, so Morgan, I want you to know for all these years, I've lived in fear that someone will someday discover a mistake in one of those documents and a senior official in the US government will demand to know who the hell signed these documents for the United States of America. Fortunately, I'm retired now, so I think retribution will not be, uh, will not be coming down on me. But the point here, of course, is that Ukraine wanted to demonstrate for all of us Americans and for the world that it was not just a successor state to the Soviet Union, but it was an independent nation with its own foreign policy, its own sovereignty. One of the reasons for recognizing and implementing Ukraine's independence, why it was so important, was that there was still, frankly, then, a lot of doubt in those fateful days as to whether these post-Soviet arrangements that were being arranged, that were created at the Belovezhskaya Woods Conference by Yeltsin, Kravchuk, and Shushkevich, whether these would really last. There were those in Russia, many of them, who were still angry at the demise of the Soviet Union. Remember, uh, many of the closest advisors to uh, Gorbachev had mounted the, uh, the uh, uh, coup against him. But there were also fears in Washington and in European capitals that things were going to fall apart and that violence would break out, particularly between Russia and Ukraine. Well, in the end, I think we were all amazed that there was no bloodshed. Sadly, uh, we now know the fighting between the two nations was simply postponed. And uh, in noting that, I'm, you know, I think we all mourn the thousands who've died in the Donbass as Putin's Russia has attempted to reassert control over parts of the Ukraine. But we also know today that the process of building a modern Ukrainian nation is, part, is far from finished. Michael and Bill have already talked about it, and I'm sure Kurt and Irina will come back to it. Ukraine faces serious territorial threats from Russia. Its sovereign territory has been occupied. And at home, it still faces many challenges to building a democratic nation built on the rule of law and a fair and economic, just economic system for all Ukrainians so that everyone can participate in the prosperity of this country. So that's why my message today is to recall how far Ukraine and its friendship with the United States have come, and we should never forget that. But we should also never forget how far Ukraine still has to go, how much the people and nation of Ukraine still need our help. But in the end, we all recognize that it's up to them to realize the dreams that their forefathers had to build this independent country in the center of Europe. Uh, of Europe. With that, I'll stop and uh, turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, John, thank you very much, and thank you for your long years of, uh, of work and uh, building U.S.-Ukraine uh, relations. It's just been amazing. Uh, let's now go to uh, Kurt Volker. Kurt, uh, you've been active in this region for a long time. You were ambassador to NATO. You were the special envoy to Ukraine. As we all know, independence uh, includes territorial integrity. It's hard to have independence unless you have energy independence, territorial integrity, and other things that go along with building an independent state. Uh, so let's turn it over to you. You're an expert in this territorial integrity area. Uh, your comments, please. Well, thank you very much, Morgan. And uh, like Michael, I'm uh, just so honored to be part of this panel with so many distinguished people. So thank you. And let me also say, I scrolled through the participants who are watching this online and see a number of good friends uh, that are uh, watching from the shadows, if you will. So greetings to all of uh, our friends who are out there as well. Uh, first and foremost, you know, this, this panel is about celebration. 
uh, because everything that John Teff just reminded us of tells us that Ukraine didn't have to make it <laughs> and Ukraine did make it. And this is really something to celebrate that uh, uh, we've seen uh, the reestablishment of a sovereign independent Ukraine and a strong sense of Ukrainian identity and nationhood. And uh, this uh, August 24th, uh, as Bill reminded, we were there last year, is an opportunity to remind and celebrate that sense of identity and to urge uh, ever greater unity uh, among Ukrainians in Ukraine. Uh, Michael highlighted the challenges of that in these, uh, these times in the United States. Now we're having a hard time uh, keeping our unity with the political and other challenges we face. Uh, Ukraine arguably faces at least as great of challenges in the United States, if not more. And uh, really building that unity around a, a strong national identity is critical. So I think that's, that's important to remember and to, to celebrate uh, this week. Um, I agree with Michael uh, that the opportunities for Ukraine have never been better which is another way of saying that Ukraine's had a lot of zigzags <laughs> since 1991. It has not all been a single upward trajectory. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, with each success of change in Ukraine, the opportunities have grown. And the opportunities are especially great now because of the younger generation in Ukraine, which really feels in its heart the sense of, of Ukrainian identity, of independence, of being democratic, of wanting to live in a fair rule of law system and to be part of a wider uh, European and Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, that will be the future of Ukraine and it's going to be uh, the brightest future that Ukraine has had in history. Um, a point to make uh, about history as well too, it's important that uh, all of us keep pushing back on the false narratives. Uh, John referenced uh, some of the uh, Russian attitudes toward Ukraine and those are still out there. And in fact, Putin has made a concerted effort to distort history in order to undermine a sense of uh, legitimacy to, uh, for Ukrainian sovereignty and nationhood. And it's very important that those of us in the West not allow that to happen, that we keep history straight and clear and keep talking about it so that uh, future generations know uh, that there is a Ukraine and it is a legitimate place and there is a uh, and independence and a right to independence and sovereignty and, and not let the distortion of history take place. Now, I mentioned the zigzags. Uh, Ukraine has had its zigzags internally in terms of democracy, uh, corruption, economic development, um, the uh, exercise of extraordinary power by oligarchs outside of normal political structures. Uh, this has been difficult for Ukraine. Uh, it's also been difficult because support from its friends and partners has been uneven. There have been times when uh, the West, you know, European Union, United States has really been extraordinarily active and supportive of Ukraine. There are times that our attention has faded or we've been less supportive than we should be. So as much as there's a, a need for Ukraine to pull itself together uh, and do even more than it has done in the past, likewise, I think there's a need in the, in the West for those of us who, who support Ukraine to do more ourselves. And then this gets to your, your question, Morgan. It, it comes to the question of security and territorial integrity. Uh, we cannot fail to recognize that Ukraine is under active assault. Uh, this is a Russian attack and invasion of Ukraine, seizing Crimea, uh, destabilizing and occupying the Donbas. I would argue not for the purpose of controlling the Donbas so much as for the purpose of destabilizing Ukraine as a whole and trying to block Ukraine's development and prevent Ukraine's uh, closer integration with Europe. Uh, and I think we need to be very clear about uh, that this is a Russian activity. It is not an indigenous activity. It is with a purpose, which I just described. And it is one that Ukraine is actively fighting and resisting, but cannot resist alone. And so Ukraine needs that active support. We have to remember that this is uh, a cynical policy as well because of the human toll uh, that uh, has occurred in Eastern Ukraine as a result of Russia's aggression. Uh, we're getting close to 15,000 people who have been killed in Eastern Ukraine as a result of Russia's aggression. And this still remains the largest displacement of people by a war in Europe 
since World War II itself. Uh, so uh, we can't turn a blind eye to this and we have to, to push back on this as much as possible. And we have to be doing everything we can to support the people who are affected by this. This is something where I think Ukraine needs to lead uh, and perhaps can do even more. I think President Zelensky has done a lot, but I still believe there's more that can be done in terms of outreach and efforts to, to reach the population in Eastern Ukraine, even in the occupied areas, and to demonstrate that if that is impossible, it is only because Russia is preventing it. Uh, and I think that's an important message for people to understand as well. In the Q&A uh, around this session, one of the questions was about uh, environmental cleanup and nuclear waste in the occupied areas. That is a real problem. And I think we need to highlight that uh, Russia controls this territory at the moment. Russia is not cleaning up the nuclear waste. And the only way this is going to be cleaned up is if Russia allows Ukrainian people, Ukrainian teams, access to areas to work on the environment. And the only way that's going to happen is if Russia withdraws its forces and allows an environment of security to be created. Uh, I want to commend uh, the uh, Ukrainian leadership, both under President Zelensky and before him under President Poroshenko. It may surprise Ukrainians that it's possible to complement both of them at the same time. But uh, I think it is important because I think they are both working very hard or both work very hard for their country. And in the case of uh, Eastern Ukraine, both of them worked to strengthen sovereignty, strengthen independence, make sure the military got the resources that it needed to defend the country, and at the same time participate in efforts to bring peace. Uh, there won't be peace and there won't be a restoration of sovereignty and territorial integrity unless Russia withdraws. And Russia is not going to withdraw unless it sees, on the one hand, Ukraine is successful anyway. Its effort to block Ukraine is failing. And on the other hand, that there is a mechanism, there's a negotiation, there is a way in which Russia can withdraw and get some kind of face saving as it does so. And I think negotiations in the Minsk agreements and the participation of France and Germany and support from the United States is critical to that. And I think both administrations have done that and have been creative in doing so. And I think they need to continue that. And I think they continue to need as much uh, European and US support as possible. Uh, I'll stop there and I look forward to, to taking part in the question and answer that I know is going to follow. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very important area uh, for the future. And as you said, uh, Ukraine needs the support of the EU and the United States more than ever. And uh, we got to work to uh, unify the forces to support Ukraine. Uh, they can do a lot themselves, but they also need continued support from the EU and from the United States. Um, Arena, you were raised in the country of Georgia. You came to Kiev to, to, to study law. You became a lawyer. You started your own law firm. You've been a strong patriot for business development, investment, legal reform. You've been a leader in the US-Ukraine Business Council, leader for culture. Your comments, please. Thank you, Morgan. Very happy to see everybody. Um, it's not only the all-star team, it's also a veterans team. So as veterans, I hope we are allowed to sort of have a little trip down the memory lane, talk about past and sort of how we project it into the future. Um, having, been, having lived behind the Iron Curtain, for me, when Ukraine became independent, I think the most important thing was to get rid of the post-colonial, post-Soviet trauma and past and join the civilized world. That was the task number one. And um, to me, the first sign that it was happening was in early 90s. Um, I don't know if any of you remember, but on Maidan uh, was a pretty tall postament with a Lenin monument. And then it was removed and replaced by a huge Coca-Cola sign. So for me, this was the beginning of this sort of, you know, um, purge of, of terrible Soviet, post-Soviet, post-colonial trauma. Now, the other challenge is now to join the civilized world. And uh, I think Ukraine has done a lot and it was driven by Ukrainian people. It wasn't driven by politicians. It wasn't driven by 
sort of uh, government structures, it was driven by people. And uh, if, if we look at today's uh, news, uh, news items, you know, I read only yesterday a couple of items that I wanted to share with you about Ukraine. One was in the Forbes article. And uh, that's what it says. Ukraine has a unique positioning in the world of blockchain, fintech, and crypto. Now, if 20 years ago, somebody would read this sentence to us, would we even understand? It would be gibberish. I mean, we wouldn't understand what it's talking about. And today, all of a sudden, Ukraine, you know, is riding the IT wave and is a global IT powerhouse. Another news item that I also saw recently that um, a Ukrainian ad agency, Banda, is opening an office in California and will be providing promotional campaign for a Hollywood film, brand creation for two investment funds, and preparing to launch a new campaign for a cannabis brand. So again, you know, it's not only the world came to Ukraine, but now Ukraine comes to the world. It's, it's a part of the global um, community, part of the global business, part of the global culture. And to me, you know, what really brought us to this breakthrough? And here I want to talk briefly about economy and reforms and rule of law, about institutions, about people, the talent, and uh, about culture. And in terms of economy and reforms, uh, of course, we have a long list wish list of what needs to be done, what needs to be done faster, etc. Uh, the, there are several areas if we go back 30 years or 25 years or 20 years, there are several areas that are still there. You know, we were talking about privatization. I remember it very vividly in early 90s, as long as Ukraine became independent, you know, switched to the market economy, privatization was the buzzword. And we're still talking about it today. Uh, I, I think there have been some recent signs that you know finally the privatization will, will move forward, but it hasn't been really uh, showing a lot of progress in, in the last 30 years. Another one is the land market. Uh, Ukraine, unfortunately, is part of a very small, charming group of uh, countries that do not have a free land market. And that includes, uh, I believe, Venezuela and North Korea, etc. And that's, that's a stigma, you know, that's, that's a shame. That's something that, you know, throws Ukraine back into this sort of serfdom for, for, for Ukrainian landowners, for farmers. And uh, it has been going on for 30 years. Every time, you know, everybody would say that we need to leave the moratorium on the sale of agricultural land, and it has not happened until now. Very recently, a few months ago, this moratorium was partially lifted. I think the land reform has started. It started in a sort of circumcised way, but at least it started. So those problems that we have been experiencing for 30 years, they start lifting and they start sort of, you know, being resolved slowly but gradually. Um, on the other hand, you know, we have seen tremendous prog progress in the flagship industries of Ukraine, um, like, for example, IT, agro, metals, infrastructure, revived our, our aerospace, etc. But I think what really um, is important and what is the core of Ukraine's economy is small and medium-sized businesses. And I think that's where Ukrainians can sort of demonstrate their entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, if you look at the niche businesses that Ukrainians are uh, organizing and sort of coming out into the global stage with those businesses, uh, it's hard to believe that, for example, uh, small Ukrainian farmers are biggest suppliers of escargot, of snails to French, or frog legs, or oysters. So it tells you that there is so much potential, not only in big industries, but there is a huge potential in the entrepreneurship of people. And I think that's what gets overlooked very often. Uh, you know, let's talk about big things, but small and medium businesses are something that is really the core of this country, as in the neighboring Poland, for example. So that's something to, to watch and to help. Um, 
in terms of um, legal reform, in terms of, you know, reforms, I think we're st still talking about the same things we talked about 30 years ago, judicial reform. There was a massive attempt to carry out a judicial re reform under the previous leadership, under Poroshenko government. And I, I have to admit that a lot has been done. I know that everybody criticizes uh, judicial reform all the time, but I can tell you that uh, at least the training of new judges, the process of selection of judges was very modern, transparent, and the training was extremely comprehensive. Uh, one of my colleagues at my law firm, one of my lawyers decided to go through this training. And uh, I can tell you that the first thing that they had in their training were the um, Europe European Court of Human Rights cases. That's how they started their training with the, with the cases of European Court of Human Rights. The selection of the Supreme Court was extremely rigorous, extremely transparent, you know, lots of tests, etc. There was a commission on uh, uh, dignity, etc. So th there is a very good uh, start, but there is no second stage. And, and the courts are still uh, stigmatized in Ukraine and there is no trust to courts in Ukraine. So I think that's something that, you know, is very, very important to do. Uh, a great reform that uh, nobody is really talking about is digitalization of government, e-government. There is so much going on on this front. Uh, if you talk to simple people that you know have to deal with, for example, their retirement and other things, they now have to make several clicks and their retirement comes to them in the virtual form. It used to be a nightmare. You had to go through several levels of bureaucracy and you know, walk around for, for days, for weeks to get your retirement. So this is happening as we speak, you know, the digitalized passports, all of this. Very, very, very important. And uh, also, you know, one of the most uh, probably best in the world systems of public procurement, Prazora, which keep getting awards all the time. And it's interesting that not only government public procurement, but also the businesses are getting their procurement through Prazoro system. So, so I see um, lots and lots of positives. I think those reforms that have stalled for years now show signs of progress. We just don't, cannot give up, we have to push them. Now, what's very important in pushing these reforms and in pushing progress are institutions. And uh, Ukraine mostly is moved forward by non-governmental institutions. Um, and here, you know, there are all kinds of councils and uh, Bill Taylor was mentioning several of them and promoting several of them. I, I want to mention also personally, um, Ukraine Invest, uh, Ukraine House in Davos, um, also, the newly created Office of uh, Simple Solutions and Results by President Saakashvili. And I love simple. I think we all need to move towards simplification because the old Soviet system and the oligarchic system in Ukraine loved complicated. The special, the special interest wants complicated that you know only they can understand what's going on and only they can take advantage of the system. The simple system is for the advantage of everybody. So, you know, I, I, I read some of the materials that the uh, Office of Simple Solutions and Results has prepared, and, and I feel that they're very encouraging. I just hope that their projects will be implemented and not just stay on paper, as happened in, uh, in the past. Business associations. Business associations are very important and they matured. I remember some of the business associations that started with two people. There was the president and the secretary. And now those business associations are really an important uh, voice in, in Ukraine reforms and Ukraine economy. Um, I want to talk just a couple of words about our own USUBC. Uh, Morgan just said that we're having an anniversary this year, 25th anniversary. This means that we are almost as young or as old as an independent Ukraine. Is indep independent Ukraine is 29 years old and we are 25. So we're almost the same age. And I do remember I joined in early nineties and I do remember that this organization started small 
And today uh, it's more than 200 members. It's extremely influential. And I really want to celebrate USUBC and to congratulate Morgan on, on this huge success that we have been having for the past probably 15 years at least. And I also want to say that although we are veterans as USUBC, we are also riding the IT digitalized wave. And uh, uh, Morgan was one of the first one, I think among the International Business Association to start those Zoom meetings. And uh, look, we are here again on Zoom. Uh, my only hope is that when we do celebrate our 25th anniversary, that we raise a real glass of champagne and we can see each other and you know, give each other a big hug and celebrate in, in normal personal manner. I also want to talk just a little bit about people of Ukraine. And um, for me, uh, people of Ukraine is not just you know, ethnical Ukrainians or those who have been there from the beginning. Uh, and not only the young generation, everybody praises the young generation. You know, you all talked about young generation, but I want to talk also about non-young generation because I think we have a lot of, a lot to give and a lot to share still. And uh, Ukrainian people and those who drive Ukraine forward are Ukrainians, of course, young generation or any generation. But also there is a group of us that, um, came uh, to Ukraine at different times for different reasons, and then fell in love deeply and forever. That's, that's the, my, my case at least. And uh, then there is the old diaspora, those who preserve Ukrainian language, Ukrainian culture and uh, traditions in the darkest days of communism, uh, and those who are involved in every uh, aspect of Ukrainian life. Then there is new diaspora, and this new diaspora is discounted often, but they collectively are the biggest investors in Ukraine. $13 billion every year that Zarabichane are transferring to their own country and starting new businesses, bringing civilized practices, etc. cetera. Um, there are groups of friends of Ukraine, Georgian groups uh, from Baltics, Americans, etc. cetera. I, I know that Natalka Yaresko is watching us today. So I want to greet her and to thank her for this uh, dedicated and selfless work that she has done for Ukraine at the most difficult moment and others as well. So um, there is an okay. uh, human capital of Ukrainians, friends of Ukraine that is there available that is moving this country for, forward. And uh, Somebody was talking about emerging leaders, about new leaders. We, we all want to see them and we all want them to succeed because you know, these false starts that happen with several young political movements, um, they, they don't, I understand that there is like uh, time for them to learn, etc. but time accelerated. So they need to catch up very, very quickly and, and move to, to the real leadership roles. And lastly, okay. There is Ukrainian culture, and uh, without an authentic and glorious Ukrainian culture, there will be no modern Ukraine, no civilized Ukraine. So I always um, call on everybody to uh, support Ukrainian culture and uh, to be part of it. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, thank you very much, Irina, uh, and for your amazing work. We're very pleased to say that there's well over 300 people watching this today. Uh, through this modern technology. And we're very pleased to be able to share this with uh, people in Europe and all uh, Ukraine, US, all over the world. Let's go back to Bill Taylor real quick. Everybody's talked about how important it is for the United States support of Ukraine. And it's been there for, from day one. Uh, but we need to make sure that uh, the United States expands its support of Ukraine to support continued independence. And also there's a lot Ukraine can do. So Bill, any quick comments about what Ukraine can do to build stronger support with the United States and what the United States can do to build stronger support with Ukraine? That two-way relationship is critical to moving independence forward. Bill, your comments. Thanks, Morgan. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, 
one of the things that I've always reassured uh, my Ukrainian friends um, and did all last year was the bipartisan support for Ukraine that you have in the United States and, and how important that bipartisan support is. And it's bipartisan in the Congress. Um, it's Republicans and Democrats in the car. It's in the House and the Senate. It's in the State Department, Defense Department, NSC. It's, it's the range of support, the range of, of organizations um, in Washington that support Ukraine's independence and territorial integrity and democratic in, uh, direction um, and integration. Into, that's there. That's there. And don't jeopardize it. Uh, that's this. That's really the valuable asset. The most valuable asset that the Ukrainians have uh, in Washington is that bipartisan support, and it's been there for a long time. And and um, we've got elections coming up. Of course, uh, we've got uh, local elections coming up in uh, in Ukraine. But we also there is. I understand there's this, there's a presidential election going on here. Don't get involved in that election. Um, don't mess with our our politics, and we won't mess with your your elections in the, in, the, in the local elections. Don't do that. Um, and I think um, the Ukrainians uh, understand that. And so this is, uh, uh, this, this is an important time for us um, and, and we'll see how, how things go. But it, no matter what the outcome of our election in November, the support for Ukraine is going to be there. Thank you very much. We all know that Ukraine can't fight this hybrid war that Russia's uh, uh, has instigated against the West. So, uh, Michael Blazer, your comments about what Ukraine could do to strengthen their support with the United States and vice versa. I think Ukraine can um, lead. Um, I've been writing and talking about the hybrid warfare that Russia unleashed on the world for many years now. It seems like forever. I, I just... Uh, uh, I feel so frustrated about that. And uh, I have been talking to a number of Ukrainian officials, senior level officials over the last at least five, six years. And what I've been suggesting to them is that with the new generation, new technology, Ukraine being the front line of this hybrid warfare that Russia is fighting with the West, Ukraine is a proxy for the West. It is a proxy for the United States to fight this war instead of continuously asking for help, give us help, be, give us help. Why don't you lead? Why don't you show by example how this hybrid warfare, uh, cyber and all other things can be fought? Ukraine has the capabilities to do that. And they have been based on my conversations with some of them making some progress in that. But I'd like to see much more of that. On the other hand, and that goes back to what Bill was saying, we have a significant bipartisan support in the United States. No matter what you hear, no matter what you read, we have a lot of people on both sides of the aisle that support independent Ukraine, that understand that Ukraine is the front line, Ukraine fighting the proxy war with Russia for the United States. Yes, we have some people that somehow do not understand that. I'm not going to name any names, but we have enough good people on both sides of the aisle that understand that. And I think the combination of that, the Ukrainian leading the charge and showing how it can be done, and this bipartisan support from the United States, that's what we need to see more of in the future. Thank you very much. John Taft, your comments on this uh, area of what Ukraine can do to build their leadership with the EU and the United States and vice versa. I think uh, Bill and, and Michael have hit the high points here. Uh, when I was ambassador, of course, it was the Yanukovych period for the most part. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we were able to do, and this was uh, credit to the people in Washington as much as out in Ukraine, was to, to keep this uh, bipartisan consensus. Because there were times, given some of the things that Yanukovych did, like extending the, uh, the uh, Russian uh, lease on Sevastopol that made a lot of people in Washington start to wonder uh, what the hell's going on here? Is this someplace we should continue to be engaged? And fortunately we did. Um, you know, I saw, Michael, one, maybe another point I can emphasize is education. I saw that one of the uh, questions that came in was about the educational system. 
And, you know, as I think back on my time in Ukraine, one of the things that we tried really hard to do was to, uh, uh, to, to engage, to work with, to help educational institutions. Um, uh, Kiv Mohila, of course, was, has always been something the American Embassy has worked on. But we tried really hard to, uh, uh, to work with the rector of Kiev uh, Polytechnic and the university out in Kharkiv that were at that time really starting to, to develop uh, a whole range of computer scientists and computer engineers and things, uh, which we thought were uh, crucial for the future. Uh, I remember uh, in particular that we tried hard when I was in Donetsk to, uh, this is actually in, uh, in April of, uh, of uh, right, I guess 20, 2013, before I left, I was there and I spoke at three different or four different educational institutions there. And I remember coming away from that thinking, gosh, these kids are smart. They all had good questions. Most of them asked them in English. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, and I've often thought since, of course, given what's happened, you know, I wonder how many of those kids are still there, how many either went to, to the West or to Russia. But, you know, you could just see it. And I'm sure Bill and uh, Irina and, and others have seen the same kind of thing. That educational component is really a key part of it. And I certainly hope that whoever is elected in November will keep that as a key part of our assistance to uh, Ukraine, because it really is, uh, as we all know, the future. Oh, thank you very much. Kurt, you know that the strongest uh, support in the United States for years has been from the U.S. Congress. We all know it's very strong, and we know a lot of people there understand that this uh, fight against uh, the Russian hybrid war is not just Ukraine. It's in a whole broader area. So what, what do you think uh, you, Ukraine can do to, to build their support for the United States and vice versa? Uh, you've been hands-on with this uh, for several years now. Great. Well, thank you, Morgan. A uh, couple of things uh, that are right on point there. One of them, there is already uh, legislation in the Congress that will increase sanctions uh, related to Nord Stream 2. Um, that's going to pass, um, and that is something that the administration will have to take account of. Uh, it may be short-lived. It may be just through the end of this administration uh, or may go into the next one, but there is very strong support in Congress for pushback on, on Russia uh, because of Nord Stream, but because of its wider aggression in the region. And I think uh, the Ukrainian uh, embassy and Ukrainian quote unquote visitors, as we do these things by Zoom now, uh, can stay engaged with members of Congress, keep them informed uh, about what is happening. Second thing, uh, there is already a proposal uh, in place uh, to uh, renew and extend uh, uh, U.S. security assistance for Ukraine. It's uh, through the Pentagon, uh, the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, and through the State Department of uh, Foreign Military Financing and uh, Training. And there is a proposal from Senator Risch and Senator Menendez to triple the size of U.S. FMF from 115 million to uh, about 300 plus million. And I think that's something that we could all get behind and support. There's a lot more need there uh, that the U.S. could help fill. Also, Ukraine has already done something very significant, which is uh, last week, uh, President Zelensky signed uh, a Defense Procurement Act, which reforms the defense procurement process in Ukraine, uh, will facilitate Ukraine working together with the United States in foreign military sales, and also make more transparent and hopefully less corrupt some of the sourcing of equipment and training for the Ukrainian military. Uh, that also is very significant and something we should build upon. Uh, and finally, I think that Ukraine uh, is a great testing ground or great learning ground for the United States and for NATO. Uh, over the past few years, the NATO relationship with Ukraine has expanded dramatically. But nonetheless, I think there's still more to do where we can learn from Ukraine uh, about what Russia's uh, activities are, uh, its methods, its tactics, what are successful ways of blunting those aggressive efforts by Ukraine, how we can build greater resilience, uh, both in the Ukrainian military and in Ukrainian society. Uh, so uh, there are several things there that we can do. And if it's all right with you, Morgan, I'm gonna pick out one of the questions from the Q&A, uh, which is, 
Um, in one word, uh, how would you summarize what Ukraine has accomplished since 91? And I'm going to extend that and say, and what would you say uh, is the greatest threat that Ukraine faces? And then what is the greatest recommendation for Ukraine? Uh, the one word of what it's accomplished is survival. The one word for what's ahead is assault from Russia. And the one word of what to do is build. Build the strongest country you can. Hey, thank you, Kurt. Yes, on everybody's mind right now is some anxiety about what's going on in Belarus and what Putin might do and what unsettledness there, how that might affect Ukraine's independence, territory, integrity, and their strength. Any quick comments from you about what's going on in Belarus? Sure. Um, uh, what we see in Belarus, you know, is, is sui generis. It's not Ukraine. It's not Venezuela. It's not Georgia. It's Belarus. So there are differences. Uh, Putin has laid several traps at once, not just one. <laughs> so the options that all of which would be fine for Putin would be Lukashenko cracks down and stays in power. Another one is Lukashenko is replaced by somebody who's favorable to Russia. Another is that Lukashenko invites Russian advisors in to help him restore order, and he could live with that as well. Uh, another is that Lukashenko uh, diffuses the situation eventually by scheduling new elections and then steals them six months from now. So Putin has a lot of cards that he is prepared to, to ride out here. Uh, I think that the West needs to stay focused on insisting that there be new elections and getting international monitoring and organizations in there to try to make them as free and fair as possible uh, when those would occur. That's probably the best outcome that we can do. I think Ukraine has a vital interest in Belarusian sovereignty, independence, freedom, and democracy. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we always talk about is how Ukraine is um, a, a fulcrum between the ascendance of democracy and integration and freedom and prosperity in Europe versus the maintenance of a Russian empire at the expense of the people that live in that empire. Um, and Ukraine is in the middle. If Ukraine succeeds and is part of that integrating Europe, it sets the direction for all of Europe and ultimately has an impact on Russia. The other way around is true as well. If Russia uh, is able to block Ukraine and keep it subordinated under a, an old empire concept uh, from Moscow, that is going to be detrimental to the people of Ukraine, but detrimental for Europe as a whole as well. Uh, Ukraine is the big piece in this puzzle, but Belarus is similar in that respect. If Belarus can make it, then people in Russia will wonder, can we make it? Those protesters out in Khabarov may say, well, they did it. Uh, we can keep protesting. And it may inspire Ukraine. And likewise, if Belarus is sub subordinated and subjected, uh, that's just going to put the ring a little bit tighter around Ukraine as well. And that is certainly not in Ukraine's interest. So I think solidarity and support for Belarus from Ukraine is essential. Uh, Kurt, uh, repeat for us those three key words that you just said. Uh, yeah. You summarized three areas with one word each. That was great. Summarize well, that again for us. This, it was the genius of the person asking the question <laughs> who said, give us one word each. What has Ukraine accomplished since 91? What does Ukraine face in the future? And what advice do you have for Ukraine? And uh, what it's accomplished is survival. Uh, what it faces ahead is assault from Russia. And what Ukraine needs to do is build, build the strongest country possible. Oh, uh, thank you very much for that great summary. Uh, Rena, any, any quick comments from you on this area of building support between US and Ukraine? Um, th there are like a couple of aspects and first aspect is geopolitical and I think it's very important for Ukraine to remain on top of the agenda of the West and everything that you know, other panelists said about the role, you, role of Ukraine and uh, without Ukraine there is no in integrated West I believe. And uh, in this sense, I, I was very happy to see that proactive attitude of uh, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba who became the founding sort of partner in the Lublin Triangle, which was recently uh, organized with Lithuania and Poland. So I think 
relationships between US and Ukraine are absolutely essential, but don't forget about closest neighbors and allies and sort of put it all together. And the second, uh, in terms of uh, business and humanitarian aspect, I think Ukraine should be open, completely open to US business, to Western business, because those uh, businesses that come to Ukraine and become successful, they become our ambassadors on the global stage. And then Ukrainians can exit the global stage also, like those examples that I was giving. And the same about humanitarian, educational, and cultural exchanges. We have to become integral part of the, part of the West. So the sees us as part of it, and we are all you know, in, the same, in the same sort of uh, situation together. And this way we will be able to uh, resist the hybrid war uh, in a unified way and not just being divided. So I think that's essential that Ukraine becomes an integral part of the civilized world. Uh, my colleague Michael Dotsenko in Kiev has been watching the questions. Michael, do you have a couple quick, uh, direct, and uh, uh, hard questions for the panel? Michael. Uh, I'm trying to unblock the video here. And uh, uh, there are a couple of good questions. Uh, one, we actually have a member of parliament of Ukraine watching this. Uh, Ms. Maria Onova uh, is asking of uh, Ambassadors Taylor uh, uh, and of uh, Kurt Volker. Uh, in recent months from the USA, we've seen renewed calls for normalizing relations with Russia. The arguments for a new reset are based on fallacious narratives that Moscow has been advancing for years. Moscow wants the world to accept Russia's exceptionalism. Do you think uh, that appeasement of Russia will work successfully? I don't. I don't think appeasement of Russia will work successfully. And uh, Kurt and I both have uh, pushed back on this idea of a new reset. Um, I think that's uh, uh, misguided. There were a lot of people in, this, in, in the United States and other places who signed on to this, this idea. Um, uh, we need to be tough. The, there is a policy change that needs to happen, and it's not in the United States. The policy change that needs to happen is in the Kremlin, um, and that's what that's what the key is. So uh, I think, but I'll, I'll let Kurt respond as well. But uh, we pushed real hard back against resets. Yeah, yes, Kurt. We did. Yes, thank you. It was an open letter signed by several respected and experienced people in Politico that called for a rethink of U.S.-Russia policy. Uh, Bill and I and several others signed uh, a letter in response to that, another open letter, to say, no, that is not right. Um, and I also published my own article in Foreign Policy, which I encourage you to look up, uh, in which I'm, I close with what Bill just said. That uh, First off, it's titled, No More Resets. And the closing line is that it is now is not the time for the, now is the time not for the West, but for Russia to rethink its policies. Uh, and we should not be negotiating with ourselves or talking ourselves into accepting Russian aggression. Uh, Michael, another question. Um, I guess Ambassador has already asked, uh, answered uh, Mr. Slava Feklin's uh, question from General Electric, but he's got still one unanswered. What are the chances of military and financial assistance to Ukraine uh, expanding or reducing? kind of more detailed on the same policy question. Well, I'll just answer quickly on the military side. I think the, the, it is already primed to increase by $25 million this year. And I think the prospect of increasing it by about 250 to 300 million is real. And uh, it, it's worth weighing in to support that in the Senate and then in the House. Uh, on economic assistance, I think it's possible, but I think it's going to uh, be a, give and take with the government in Kyiv, because I think there's a little bit more confidence, confidence building to do that such assistance will be well used. Uh, another question, Michael. Uh, another question is from Chris Steiniger uh, to uh, Ambassador Taylor and to Mr. Blazer. For the next generation of young Ukrainian political leaders, what skills, abilities, and knowledge will be the most needed? So uh, 
Ukrainians understand politics. Um, you, I, I was always impressed when I was there that uh, on, on Friday nights, the, uh, the talk shows, the debates, the, the uh, talking policy discussions went you know, nine into one or two or three in the morning. This is incredible. Um, Ukrainians understand politics and they understand what's necessary to, to succeed. Um, I have great respect um, for this younger generation. I mentioned one of the three organizations that is, uh, that is building, as, as, as Rina says, is there are many um, uh, who are focused on young people. Um, um, while I was there last, uh, last year, uh, I had multiple occasions to, to talk with and interact with and be encouraged by, inspired by uh, young Ukrainians who are dedicated to their country and they're dedicated to making their country succeed. Um, uh, so I have great confidence in, uh, uh, in, in the ability um, of these people to do that. Michael undoubtedly got some answers to that question as well. Michael, Michael, Blazer. Okay. Um, so the question is what skills, knowledge uh, will be useful and necessary for the new leadership? Um, I would suggest two, um, history and geography. I mean, if they can kind of focus on those two, that would be very helpful. History, let's uh, make sure that we don't reinvent the wheel. I don't know how many times uh, since uh, I've been working in Ukraine, I use that phrase, please do not reinvent the wheel. I mean, it, it's been done, it's been tried, it did not work. Let's just kind of learn from that. Geography is also important because you need to understand that there are other countries in the world that some are in the very similar circumstances, can be in, in the circumstances that are similar to yours, and study that. Understand that, that the, what we call in business uh, the, the pace setter study, or uh, identifying the best in class and learning from them, taking those lessons. That's how you get ahead much quicker than trying to invent to start everything from scratch. Bill already mentioned technology. I think technology is absolutely critical. In the new world, without technology, they're not going to get very far. But if they will try to just move forward from the base of knowledge already in presence in, in the world and use technology to help them advance that further, I think that that's the best way to proceed. Michael, in terms of uh, Kurt's concept about how to build the future, one of the biggest problems Ukraine has had is their dependence upon Russia for energy. It's hard to be independent if you're totally dependent upon somebody else for energy. Any quick comments about building energy independence to help build Ukraine for the future? Um, this is a very uh, frustrating topic for me because, uh, as many people know, Ukraine can be energy independent and, in fact, net energy exporter in a fairly short period of time. We're talking two, three, four, five years at the most. All that it needs to do is to open up the markets. Somehow, Ukraine has decided that a government-owned, government-controlled, and government-run institutions supposed to take care of the energy sector instead of opening that market to private companies. If Ukraine could just develop the resources that it has in Dnipro-Donetsk Basin, if Ukraine can, can actually work on the transit system, using the technology and the capital from the West, be it United States or Europe, it really does not matter. Just open the markets, allow for private capital to come in, compete. There is no need, I mean, I, I, sometimes I say, and I've been criticized for that, that the government institutions like NAFTA, gas, whatever, they just need to be broken apart and they will be dead eventually. There is no need to necessarily shut them down. Just let the private capital compete with them on the level playing field, and you will see what happens. And that will solve the problem because without being independent, energy independent from Russia, Ukraine will never be an independent country in the true sense of that word. Thank you very much, a very critical, important area. Okay, let's, uh, let's kind of go to the panelists and kind of wrap up on uh, Kurt's three key words. Let's start with Bill Taylor again, survival, assault, and build. Any comments about those as we uh, final comments from our uh, panel about moving Ukraine forward into 30 years of independence, 35, 40, survival, oh. assault, build. 
so Bill. the chat so uh <clears throat> the question from the from the person there was what was the accomplishment what was the challenge and i kurt's got three great ones i would i would say uh uh maintaining their democracy through so democracy is the word but the civil society civil society knows where ukraine wants to go so i think that's so democracy there and i would say yeah i would say defend um, against the, the, the Russian attack that we've been talking about, because as John Teft has said, and others have said, Ukraine's on the front line, um, and uh, they're defending themselves and the Europeans and the Americans um, and the rest of the world. And the last thing, uh, um, yeah, I would say unity. Um, it's hard for Ukraine. You know, you're, there are real politics in Ukraine. That's why my first point about democracy is, is there are real politics there. But um, in order to defend, um, against the Russians, um, Ukraine needs to be unified um, and it needs to pull together. So I, my, my third one would be unity. Uh, Kurt, we'll give you a copyright on survival, assault, and build. Any five comments from you again on those three concepts? Well, uh, part of building, I want to endorse what everyone has said about education. And I'll just mention that I'm involved in a project to establish an American university in Kyiv with opening doors next fall. Uh, 2021, and I, I hope that we're able to bring American uh, STEM education and, and medicine education uh, to students in Ukraine without their having to travel abroad. Um, so I, I see that as part of BUILD, and I want to echo what Bill said uh, about unity as well. That's also part of building a strong country as a unified country. Um, John Taft, survival assault BUILD. I agree with everything that uh, Bill and uh, Kurt have said. I just uh, pick up on one point. Kurt gave a very uh, good summary of the different options that are open to Putin. Um, and so this kind of falls in the, the second category of assault or maybe the first survival. Uh, Putin has a number of options, but also faced some risks here. And I think we in Ukraine have to watch this very, very carefully. I'm also opposed to a reset. I, I did not sign any of the documents because my employer, the Rand Corporation, doesn't want to, is a nonpartisan group and doesn't want us signing these things, as uh, Bill and Kirk know. But uh, I actually had a, uh, a spirited exchange with my friend Tom Graham on his first letter before it went out, which uh, I'll tell you more in private. Uh, the uh, I, I would just say though that there's some big questions about what's ahead in Russia. And, I don't think Putin has abandoned his idea of, uh, of uh, trying to bring Ukraine in, to its knees through the Donbass and uh, the things he's doing there. And I don't rule out that they could do something in Belarus. I think almost certainly there will be more sanctions imposed by the United States and Europe if that in fact happens. The factor is it's not just sanctions in a, in a vacuum. It's now sanctions in a, in a post it's in a, in a pandemic and then in a post-pandemic environment. And Russia's already lost 10% GDP through the course of this thing. And I think very carefully watching the impact of that, particularly if, uh, if uh, energy prices stay down, how's Russia gonna manage this and how, what is that gonna force Putin to do? And I acknowledge that he, they've just hit $600 billion in their, in their big uh, government slush fund. But I think uh, it's not; it's a different situation inside of Russia in terms of what Putin has to deal with when he makes some of these foreign policy calculations dealing with what he would call the near abroad. Thanks. Uh, Michael Blazer, uh, two critical areas for building Ukraine. We just mentioned one of them, energy. Uh, it's greatly underdeveloped. Another one is agriculture, agribusiness, ag exports. You've been deeply involved in that also, area. That's a great way to build uh, Ukraine, starting with land, uh, a land market. Any comments from you, Michael, about building Ukraine's agricultural and agricultural export future? Sure. I mean, again, I'm not going to say anything new here that Ukraine used to be known as a breadbasket of Europe, could be a breadbasket of, of the whole world, uh, if you just let the, the market forces develop. But with your permission, Morgan, I'd like to, uh, since we're trying to close here, expand okay. a broader perspective. Um, and that is to sure. go back to what Kurt and, and Bill and, and John actually were saying, what are the uh, main accomplishments and then what are the main challenges for Ukraine uh, going forward? 
I think the main accomplishment, I would have to agree with Bill, uh, is, is democracy. I mean, I, I think Ukraine has reached that uh, area where it's indisputable that it, it has that. Um, now, what it needs to do, it needs to improve that. But I would add one more word, which to me, uh, as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, as an investor is very critical, and that word is market. Ukraine has been trying to move from this old Soviet centrally planned economy to the market economy all this time and has made some progress, just like in democracy. They were moving from the Soviet communist system to democracy. But those two things are very much interrelated. So if Ukraine can focus on building its democracy and the market economy, that is the way, in fact, to address the third point that Kurt made. This is how to build they are under assault. They will be under assault. There is no question about it. And there is only question how much support they will get from the West, which is actually a bad question, but it is there. So Ukraine, in order for them to succeed, if they can focus on building their democracy and building their market economy so they can increase the power, they can be successful. They can do exactly what Putin is so afraid of. What he does not want is to have a successful, democratic market economy built based country on its borders. This is the nightmare for him. Let's do that. Thank you. Thank you. Final comments, Arena. Um, three words, uh, resilience, freedom, and integration. Integration in the West. Thank you very much. And uh, those are great concepts, building a democracy, building a market economy, uh, surviving, uh, heading off the assault, assaults with the help from the EU and the US and building for the future. I've always said that the best uh, defense against uh, Mr. Putin is to have a strong growing economy, a market economy, like Michael said. The best offense with the United States and the EU is to have a strong growing economy. So we know that the development of a market economy along with democracy and civil society or the keys to Ukraine future. So we want to thank uh, all of you uh, very much uh, for this uh, very interesting and informative dialogue about uh, celebrating 29 years of independence. It's really amazing. Uh, the future is ahead, as everybody has said, there's still great potential. So thank you, Ambassador Taylor. Thank you to Ambassador Teft. Thank Ambassador Volker. Thank you, Michael Blazier, and thank you, Arena Palestrovili. Morgan, before we totally close, uh, Morgan, sorry, before we totally close, uh, there was a suggestion from Peter Borisov to remember uh, U.S. Ambassador Bill Miller, who passed uh, away last year, uh, yes, who has been a true friend of Ukraine. Uh, and there is a saying in Ukrainian, heroes never die. I think he was a hero for Ukraine because of a lot that he did for Ukraine. So let's remember him. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's that's a great comment. So again, thank you, everybody. Uh, we hope to get everybody together again to talk about these important subjects. And uh, our theme uh, for USUBC this year and for the future is full speed ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Thanks birthday, Ukraine, and Slava Ukraine. Congratulations. Bye.